ex exiled lessons from James, and it's titled that for two reasons. One, James wrote this letter to uh, Christians who were scattered abroad. They were exiled for many different reasons, but many of them were scattered because of persecution and had to leave everything behind and go to other cities, other countries even, to live. And in this day, we find ourselves exiled in a sense, and that we've had to leave our former way of doing life and uh, not being driven out of our home, but forced to stay in our home. And uh, two more weeks, let's pray that that's the end of the stay at home. But uh, we want to uh, honor as best we can the recommendations uh, from uh, uh, those who are in charge. And um, the principles from this letter, though, we find to be very applicable to this time when we're facing uncertainty, when we're facing troubles. And so we're just extracting lessons from this book uh, and applying them to our situation today. Of course, they apply in, in, to Christians in any situation, but uh, they really resonate for us. We're, we've gotten most of the way. Today, I'm going to go through the chapter uh, four of James. And at that link that's available online, you can pull up my notes if you would like to have a printed copy of those or have access to those. Uh, today's lesson is really about pride and humility. And so the whole chapter focuses and bounces back and forth on this theme of pride versus humility. So let's just kick it off and read verses one through three from James chapter 4. It says, What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires? I forgot to click. Sorry. There we go. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so, you're <clears throat> so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. So some scholars think that James is telling his readers not to be drawn in to the social and political quarrels and fights that were abundant in the first century. So there, there were many different factions, especially among the Jewish people. Many of the Jews wanted to rise up and rebel against the Roman government. And there were, uh, during that first century, uh, many of uh, Jews as well as Jewish Christians were drawn into these quarrels and fights and even uh, somewhat uh, smaller scale wars against the government, but also quarrels and just political and social arguments. Other scholars think that this just refers to personal squabbles and fights that uh, occur amongst people uh, on a day-to-day -day and a regular context basis. And I believe that both interpretations are very applicable for us today because uh, I don't know if you've heard any of this, but boy, there's a lot of contentions going on concerning political uh, motivations and who's behind all of this. And so there's just a lot of strife, a lot of contention uh, on that level. And then there's the contention of uh, individual uh, animosity that we may have towards people in our lives. It all affects us in both ways. And so both interpretations are correct. But the big idea, the truth that is being expressed here is that outward conflict is the evidence or expression of inward conflict. Whatever the form of outward conflict you see, it's coming from somewhere. And where it's coming from is our inside, our in conflict within us. Too often we want to blame outward circumstances for our con the conflicts we feel within us. But whenever there is conflict, whenever there's a quarrel, whenever there's fight, whenever there's a strife, whenever there's even war, we must look for the inward, the internal. What are the heart issues that are at the root of this animosity, of this conflict, of this war? What's going on in the heart? And we must start with our heart, okay? 
I have to start with Cameron's heart. You have to start with your heart. Uh, and the desires that are waging war within us. All of us struggle with uh, conflicting desires. And they, they, they're, they're inside pulling us in different directions. And it's that, that is the source of the conflict that then spills out and we aim that, uh, 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 aim that uh, dis, uh, pleasure or this uh, struggle that we have inwardly, we find someone outwardly to focus and blame. Uh, it's a hard but essential truth to grow in maturity that our emotions are ours, all right? If you feel angry, it's your anger, okay? It's yours. If you are envious, that's something in you. If you're, if you're mad, if you're, if you're sad, that's something in you. Uh, and, and, and we can't say it's their fault. We have to own our own emotions. We can't point to others as the cause of our emotional state. Okay, so our emotions, the, our emo, what we're feeling inside, that is a reaction often to what others have done, their actions, their words, or their influence, all right? And so, yes, other people have a part. Other people are doing things. Other people are saying things. Other people have influence, and not just people, but segments of the society, things like media, government, all these things have influence. Our reaction or response to their influence causes us to have emotions. That's normal. And emotions in and of themselves, they're not wrong. They're just emotions. Emotions are never right or wrong. They're just emotions. It's how we respond to that emotional state that makes it either productive or destructive. And so if someone says something that you totally disagree with, that doesn't mean that you have to become angry. You can, in, with joy and gentleness, express your, your response or your opinion or your perspective on the same thing that they're saying. Or if they get all... Uh, uh, upset and angry and pounding their fist, it doesn't mean you have to answer in kind. Uh, the Bible says never return evil for evil. And so don't be drawn in just because people are uh, raising things. I mean, that's really often the, um, uh, the, the impetus that's, that's behind a lot of words and actions is to cause an emotional response and then when you respond emotionally out of that emotionally and you lose control then it leads you into a destructive pattern that then just creates a destructive cycle james gets to the heart of the issue the heart of the problem with two principles that work in unison it says you don't have because you don't ask that's principle number one and the second principle, and when you do ask, your motives are wrong. And so, wow, you don't have, uh, not having something stirs up jealousy, stirs up envy that leads to contention, that leads to war, that leads to even taking what is not yours or killing people that have something that you have. And it's all because we don't ask for what we need. Or... When we ask, we ask for the wrong motivation. Our motivation is not good. And so the questions we need to ask ourselves and the big ideas that are behind this portion of this chapter, these verses, uh, is where are we going to to get our needs met? Do we go to our Heavenly Father from whom all good things come? Or do we look at getting what we want or we think we need from others and taking it in an unjust way or an unhealthy way. And then how do we respond when we perceive, rightfully or wrongfully, that others are getting what we think we deserve? Others are getting an advantage over us or others are taking advantage of us or others are using this situation for their political advancement 
or others are, we are at a disadvantage because of this reason or that reason. How do you respond to that? And this passage is saying, don't respond to it out of, that, out of anger, out of envy, out of strife. But go to your Father with right motives and ask Him, and He will take care of you. The promise is we have a Heavenly Father that is well able to take care of us. But we need to trust Him. We need to trust Him, and we need to have the right motives when we ask Him. Next verses from 4 to 6 says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. The word adulterers here is used not in the sense of marital infidelity, but rather in uh, uh, referring to infidelity in our relationship with God. And when it talks about being a friend of the world, what, what does that mean in this passage? Now certainly it doesn't mean that, we, uh, that it's wrong to have friends who are in the world, okay? Uh, that's, it's actually really important. Christians, make friends that aren't Christians, okay? Invest your life in the people that aren't following Jesus so that they see Jesus in you and want to enter into relationship with Jesus and come to salvation. That's the point. That's why we're here. And we need to get outside. And, and many people have found that uh, uh, the not gathering in church services has forced us into uh, the world in a way that um, we previously hadn't been doing as successfully. And so just our live streaming is now we're, we're entering into that digital world where so many people spend so much of their time. And, and, our, and, and I, every church that I've talked to have seen a, a significant increase in the number of people that are tuning in than what used to just come in their building. So having friends in the world, that's not what this is talking about. Nor does it mean that, uh, that we are not to enjoy the things of this world that are gifts of God. There's, the whole world was created for us really to enjoy. God created the world, and, and I believe the whole, you know, the world can't just set in, it, in and of itself, isolated in the middle of nothingness. He had to create the whole universe to um, support the existence of a planet upon which could support the existence of this beautiful thing we call life from the, the trees that are now fully clothed with their leaves. Aren't you happy it's spring? Hallelujah. <laughs> for us in Michigan, it's just happening. For friends of mine that live further south, they've had this for months. But uh, we finally reached summer. Hallelujah. <clears throat> and so the whole of the world is meant for us to enjoy. And enjoying it uh, properly is a blessing and a gift from God. What this is talking about, not becoming a friend of the world, means that our familiarity and our fraternity with the world must not be greater or more of an influence in our lives than our relationship with God and His people. So the familiarity and fraternity, that fraternity is a brotherhood or a being of likeness, and so our familiarity and fraternity with the world must not be greater or more influential than our relationship with God and with God's people. That must be primary. And God's rela our relationship with God and God's people needs to be the primary influence and through which we are able to influence those in the world around us. The world doesn't mean the people in the world necessarily, but more the systems, the thought patterns, the philosophies, the worldviews, the lifestyles that are based on mere rationalism or humanism or any other ism that's disconnected with relationship with the true God. 
all right? And there's just so many isms out there. But listen, it's all about relationship with God. And becoming a friend of the world is when you allow yourself to be distanced from that dependence and the relationship and the purity of your relationship with Jesus and with God our Father and with his people to the point where you become estranged from them and you're more familiar, you're more comfortable around worldly thought patterns, worldly systems, and pretty soon you'll find yourself caught up in worldly lifestyles that end up to become very, very destructive, making yourself an enemy of God. It says God's spirit is jealous for us. That's a powerful, powerful statement. But it's true. God is a jealous God. What does that mean? It means he loves us passionately. God is passionately in love with you. Not in a romantic sense, but passion in its deepest and fullest and richest meaning. The passion was most profoundly displayed when Jesus demonstrated it on the cross, when he gave his life as an expression of how much he was willing to suffer in order to obtain relationship with you. And you means every individual man, woman, and child on planet Earth that has ever lived and ever will live or is alive today. It's his passion. And and because he's willing to pay such a price, He's really invested in this relationship, folks. He loves us passionately. And that means uh, when when our uh, intimacy is drawn away from him and drawn into relationships other than him, he gets jealous because he loves us. It's the jealous love of God. God's jealous love, though, gives more grace. He's not like a jealous husband that just rages at every sign of uh, of fear of of, uh, unfaithfulness. He's a jealous God that's pure and righteous and holy. And out of that jealousy pours his grace, his favor, his compassion. He doesn't punish out of jealousy. He actually woos us. He's he's wooing us into relationship and he's wooing us to stay in relationship with him. And when our hearts, when our our fidelity, when our faithfulness is turned to other things, it stirs up a jealousy within him because it violates the completeness and the purity of his love for us. So don't take this, don't take this, don't hear this with fearful ears. Hear this. Uh, as it is intended, that God is so passionately in love with you. And he's done everything. I, you know, there's nothing in left that he could do to communicate his love. He came down and became a human and communicated and then died on the cross as an expression of that love. And all he asks in return is to, is to, to love him back. To receive his love. I mean, what a what a deal. Yeah. I mean, we get God, and in return, he gets us. I think we're we we won on this deal. But there is a cost. You have to give yourself to him and not be enticed by the things and the thought patterns and the temptations of this world. Verse 7. Through 10. So humble yourself before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands. Side note, sidebar. CDC recommends washing your hands. (laughs) This way and this way and this way. Here's a Bible verse. Back it up. (laughs) Sorry, couldn't resist. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts for your loyal... Listen, this this really zeroes in. Your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Boom. Mic drop. I mean, it just sums it up. This is the issue when our loyalty becomes divided. And the response is, let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. 
Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. The proper response to conflict, remember we're talking about conflict and envy and jealousy and friendship with the world, um, all of those things that end up making us an enemy and distancing ourselves from God. The, the response to that, the proper response, how do we deal with that? Humility. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. And so really, the lack of humility is at the root of all of conflict and animosity and rage and war. It's lacking humility. And humility is at the lacking humility is at the root of making alliances with the world and the worldly system because we lack humility. He gets, he's, like he's, James is just, and God in this scripture is just drilling, drilling, drilling down to the core of the core issues in our hearts. Humility is the opposite force of all things worldly in the same way that pride is the opposing force of all things godly. Did you hear that? Humility is the opposite force of all things worldly as pride is the opposing force of all things godly. Say it another way. Pride is the sin out of which all other sins flow. And humility is the virtue out of which all other virtues flow. And I didn't come up with this. This is, this is a theological statement that's been said for, uh, for many, many centuries by many, many deep thinkers that at the root of all sin is pride. And at the root of every virtue is humility. These are rock bottom core issues of dealing with life and dealing with uh, the tensions that come about because of the circumstances that we're called to live through. But there's two promises here as well. And they work in unison like the ones we spoke of earlier in this message. It goes to, if we respond with humility, it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's that's a promise number one. Resist the devil and he will flee. And promise number two, come to God and he will come close to you. Wow, these, these are really important promises and extremely important for us to understand. This indicates that behind all of these issues that the Scripture is talking about, envy, jealousy, worldliness, selfish desires, behind all of that stuff, even behind conflict and, and things as big as war, there's a person, and the Bible calls him the devil. There's an actual being, an entity that is at work. And that enemy uses all of the circumstances and whatever circumstances he can use, he will use to cause division, disgruntledness, displeasure, to get you to turn from dependence on God and to try to meet your needs or your desires in ungodly ways. We're dealing with the person. When we resist him, he must flee. Because of this scripture, because of the truth. This is a promise. And sometimes, sometimes it happens quickly. You stand up to the enemy and the temptation goes away or the problem resolves and hallelujah. You know, maybe it takes a, just a few minutes or a few hours or a few days. But sometimes you have to stand in resistance for a long time. And that requires endurance. Sometimes it's years. Sometimes you have to stand against the work of the enemy for decades. Sometimes you will have to stand and you won't even see the victory because it won't come until after your lifetime passes. Read the Bible, read chapter 11 of Hebrews uh, about the heroes of faith, how they died believing for the promise. They died standing firm. And so the devil will flee. We have that authority. 
But the second truth is even more powerful. And I believe that resisting the devil actually looks like this second part. And that second part is draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Any and every act of drawing near to God causes God, causes God. Your actions can move God. Because he says that's what will happen. That if you draw close to him, he'll come close to you. So anytime you take a step toward him in a prayer, in a thought, in a devotion, in in an act of obedience, in, in seeking godly wisdom and purifying your life by abstaining from behaviors that are, are, are not healthy, any act that you turn and move toward him, if you, if you turn and move toward him an inch, he'll move toward you in eternity. <laughs> Yeah, he will cross and already has the divide between heaven and earth and hell to reach us. And all we have to do is just turn to him, seek him a little, and he'll come close. And it's in that act, see, when when you turn and seek God and God's coming towards you, that's what drives the devil away. That's why the devil flees, because he sees God coming, all right? Right? And he knows that he can't stand up to God. And so what does it look like to resist the devil? Draw near to God. It doesn't mean screaming at the devil or learning how to cast out demons. (laughs) It means getting in God's face and God will deal with the enemy. God will deal with his influence in your life and he will set you free. So, and this may mean, and it describes it pretty clearly here, a time of sorrow, a time of repentance for our wrong choices. But that, that's followed with the promise of God lifting us up in honor. And so the time of sorrow, the time of tears, the time of repentance is really brief. God doesn't want you moaning. <laughs> he wants you to receive his forgiveness and draw near to him so that he can lift you up. And he can put you in the place of honor. It's like the story from the Bible, the prodigal son coming back, thinking that he was just going to be a servant, a slave in his father's house. But the father very quickly put the robe on him and his ring and, and threw him a party. And so that's what it means when we turn back to our father. He wants to lift us up. Yes, we have to repent. Yes, we have to uh, uh, grieve uh, what we've done wrong. But it, the intention and the promise is that he's going to honor us. And it continues on, verse 11, says, Don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. But your job is to obey the law, not to judge whether it applies to you. God alone who gave the law is the judge. He alone has the power to save or to destroy So what right do you have to judge your neighbors? These three words, don't speak evil, I think are so important. Don't speak evil of anyone, ever. Um, It's so important of a principle to learn how to be a mature, uh, Christ-like individual. And it's so needed especially in this day when there's so much contention and there's so much strife. When we speak evil of others, we are giving in to the enemy. We're not to speak evil. Evil, according to this verse, is criticism and judgment. And I believe that we need to ruthlessly rid ourselves of all forms of criticism and judgment. Criticism is always, in my opinion, of the devil. It doesn't mean that rationally and appropriately and in love explaining why you disagree with someone or you believe that their opinion or their viewpoint or their behavior is, is wrong or, or, or destructive or, or against God. That's fine. If you can communicate it in a way that is from the place of love. But if you communicate it with the with the cutting words of criticism, it's, it's one, destructive, but it's also demonic. I like how God explains how 
our uh, conversation should be described in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. God says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification. So we need to always be speaking good and about stuff that's required to build other people up and not cutting words that cut people down. That it may impart grace to our hearers. I like how the message translates that. It says, every word a gift. And so if you're talking to someone that you adamantly disagree with, you still need to make every word a gift. And it needs to be given in a way that you're hoping that they get built up. Now, if they reject it, that's their issue. But if you say it with animosity and anger and and clamor and bitterness or criticism and judgment, then it's your problem. Verse 30 goes on, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. So this is violating that jealous love of God. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. By whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Now remember, God in Christ forgave us before we accepted Jesus, before we were Christians. So I believe that this verse isn't just talking about when you're communicating with other Christians that basically believe what you believe. I believe this is talking about whenever we communicate with another human being, because we're all one another's. And so this should define our speech and, and, and when we do, see, what happens is then we come in alignment with the authority of God. And that actually will have the power to bring about change much more effectively than if we give in to clamor and anger and judgment and criticism. That doesn't get the job done. In fact, our job, according to this verse in James, is to obey the law not judge whether it applies to us or judge others with it. We're to be obedient. We're to humble ourselves and live a life of obedience. And that obedience is intended by God, designed by God. When we step into that lifestyle, it sets us free. So it's our choice. It's your choice. It's my choice. A life of obedience to God's rule that leads to freedom from conflict and envy and and worldliness or a life given into the world system and the devil and striving for evil that results in becoming an enemy of God. Moving on, verse 13 says, Look here, you who say, Today or tomorrow we're going to go to a certain town and we'll stay there a year. We will do business there and make a profit. <laughs> How do you know what your life will look like tomorrow? Tomorrow. Or whether the stay at home will be extended another two weeks. Oh, I'm sorry. (laughs) Doesn't this apply? It's just like, wow, slam dunk, man. (laughs) Who would have thought a few months ago we would be doing this? Wow. How do you know what your life will look like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. What you ought to say, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. Otherwise, you are boasting against, about your own plans, and all such boasting is evil. Remember, it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. James tackles one last expression of pride, and that's presumption. Acting as though we can do whatever we want, whenever we like, with no regard for the will of God. This is not saying making plans or doing business is ungodly. Not at all. That's that's proven throughout all of Scripture that it's a good thing. What it's saying is that in all that we do, we need to stay humble to the will of God and realize He's the one in charge. He is sovereign over all the universe, and He certainly is sovereign over me, but I need to recognize that, and I need to align myself with that. The older I get, the more I realize how short life is, 
And many of us, especially when we're younger, we have lofty ambitions. And listen, ambition is good. You should have ambition. You should have vision for your life. Change the world. Come on, let's do it. But we need to realize how fleeting life is and focus on what's really important. Earlier, uh, just last week, my son-in-law, Peter, was interviewed on, uh, online with an interviewer. I don't know who the person was, but they knew of Peter Webb's ministry, worship arts, and so they, they did an interview with him. And uh, The interviewer asked my son-in-law, Peter, about his experience being diagnosed with cancer when he was uh, just 26 years old, just a few years ago. And Peter replied, and it was so, so powerful, of course, I was there, I was in the room with Peter and Tori when the doctor told him, and we were all uh, shocked and dumbfounded. I didn't believe it. I, I, just, I, I started to argue with the doctor. I'm like, certainly it can't be cancer, my God. You know, he's this 26-year-old kid. And Peter said, so the interviewer said, how, how, how did that affect you? And Peter said something to the fact that in an instant, everything that he thought was important no longer mattered. There was a whole new set of priorities that completely shifted his entire life. And for the next year, almost two years, his life was focused on the day-to-day battle of overcoming cancer and the side effects of it. Now, thankfully, and I'm so grateful that he did survive, and uh, uh, he is healthy and cancer-free. And he's even more wise than he already was, which was pretty stinking amazing. (laughs) But he learned something about the fragility of life. Life is fragile, which leads to the very last exhortation of this passage. It's a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. Sins of omission are just as destructive as sins of commission. So sins sins that are are things that we should do but don't are just as destructive as things that we shouldn't do but do. James is saying that we cannot wait to do what is right just because we have something else planned. When we see that something we need to do, we need to do it. Why? That Because that is an expression of true humility and being in alignment with God's character. And our time to do right, to live right, and to develop that close, intimate relationship with God and to resist the influence of the world and the devil is short. Listen, it's short. I was thinking about this. You know, if you're really blessed, you may live to be 100. That means if you're 20, you're 20% done with life. Average age for a male in America is about 80. So that would mean you're 25% done. 20! And so with each year, you have less time to get right with God. And this verse is emphasizing the importance to get right now. And it ends with this um, emphasis on a faith that is demonstrated by action, which of course is one of the main themes of this whole book, is that faith without works is dead. We need to do what we know is right and don't put it off for some other reason. And the Bible says that um, at just the right time, this is found in 2 Corinthians 6, at the right time I heard you, on the day of salvation I helped you. Indeed, the Bible says the right time is now, and today is the day of salvation. The right act that we need to do, the initial act of obedience, and to align ourselves with our Heavenly Father is the accept the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross as payment for your sin and confess that He is Lord of your life, yielding yourself to Him and committing your life to Him to follow Him. Whether you understand it or not, it means to live in obedience because of God's passionate love for you. 
So I, I, I encourage and invite you to ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life, to surrender your heart and your will to him. And as James uh, expresses here, to surrender your time and yield your plans to live a life that demonstrates humility and, and resists the influence of the enemy and pride. I'm going to ask Pastor Jiminy to come up and close the service. God bless you. Thanks for being with us.